These people can hardly believe that I'm living on $10 a day and that no one's paying me to do this journey. They're sure I have a backup crew somewhere, or maybe I'm a spy. <laughs> it's very hard for them to believe that I'm genuinely interested in their lives. <laughs> when they understand that, they take me into their families and their homes as one of their own. <laughs> this family's just slaughtered a goat. They've hung the meat out to dry for winter. <laughs> I wasn't a big meat eater before this journey. And this is no place for vegetarians. This is a bit of stomach. I think. This is a... There's no shops out here. And Mongolians hardly ever eat vegetables. One of the keys to my journey is carrying dried mutton called borts. A kilo of this can last me a couple of weeks. And it's the same stuff that Mongols had during Genghis Khan's time. And that's how they were able to go so lightweight and yet still have enough food to survive. I look forward to eating it. They used to say that with borts, Mongolian warriors could carry a whole sheep in their pocket. I've come to realise a troubling dilemma. I can camp near a nomad gur and let my horses go hungry. Or find pasture in the wilderness and spend the whole night worrying about wolves and thieves. I've started to get up three or four times every night to check the horses. It's about Oh, four o'clock in the morning and uh, suddenly there's this incredible howling and it's, it's just the most fearsome sound. Puts a real blood curdling feeling in your stomach. It sounds like there are hundreds of wolves and uh, it's, it must be some kind of innate thing with humans. It's just absolutely petrified. Horses, uh, they are prime prey for hungry wolf packs. The fire's been keeping them away so far. Mongolians believe their ancestor was the blue wolf. And to see a wolf is to be as wise as a wolf. To kill and eat a wolf is to inherit some of its wisdom. Mongolians also believe that wolves can fly and only by offering their bodies to the wolves after they die can their spirit be taken to Tengri, the god of the sky. So with these Mongolian sky burials, you can find skeletons scattered about in the wilderness. They believe it's important to turn meat eaters into eating meat. People have been living and dying and riding horses through this land for thousands of years. And really, nothing's changed. <laughs> the Mongolians believe that they are born from the earth and their spirit returns to inhabit the world around them. I'm just passing through these lands in the same way we pass through life. The horses are becoming my bridge to the land. I'm starting to understand the miracle of life on the steppe. Horses are able to turn what little grass is out here into protein, which in turn supports human life. Wherever they could find grass, the Mongols could travel. With three horses for every mounted soldier, the Mongols created the largest land empire in history. They invented the Pony Express. Messengers could gallop from Mongolia to Hungary in two weeks. But I've just got two horses, a bowl of semolina for breakfast, and I'll be lucky to make 30 kilometres before sunset.
It's 40 days since I set off, and I've travelled a thousand kilometres into Mongolia's remote northwest. Just come along the edge of the most northern desert in the world. It's uh, just over there, um, sand dunes as, as far as the eye can see. I'm now further away from a city than I've ever been in my life. But even out here, on the edge of survival, I find nomads. For these people, what we call wilderness is their home. It's a really raw life. A bad winter could wipe out their herd. Haven't washed for 15 days now, and I'm starting to feel it. Even these people who probably only wash properly, maybe once every two weeks, every month, uh, they suggested that I should wash. I washed every now and then, but took note from Genghis when he said that clean water is only for the drinking of man and beast, and to wash off the dirt is to wash off the luck. Autumn's closing in, and I've made it to the beginning of the Altai Mountains. This has certainly turned my idea of horseshoeing on its head. And this horse, good old Rusty, he's about 16 years old and he's never ever had shoes on him in his life, so he's a bit scared. Until now, my horses have been unshod, but the way ahead is a maze of high, rocky passes. I'm helped by a local herder, Dashnyam. He tells me it'll be hard going on the horses, so we're taking a camel to help with the load and give the horses a rest. Now we're gradually winding our way up to Karikar Ul, big mountains up here. It's just magnificent. Summer's come to an end and the nomads are moving down. The most important things for nomads is pasture and water. And that's the main reason why nomads have to move. There's not enough pasture all year round to stay in one spot. Each camel can take up to 300 kilograms, kids included. They're moving because the season's turned and it's already freezing up there. The Altai Mountains are a crucible of ancient nomad civilization. I've always dreamed of coming here. Oh my God! <laughs> and this is, I've got to say, 10 million times better than being stuck in an office. Oh, I, just, I just never expected this view. We're heading for the highest passes on our crossing. These peaks are around 4,000 metres. But even out here, we haven't gone unnoticed. And some hunters have found their way into my tent. They've just come in out of the cold. They've got a whole stack of fresh marmot that they've just shot. And it's nice for Dashnyam for a bit of company. And of course, they're a bit surprised to discover there's an Australian here. <laughs> and they've been living in this cave for about six days. You just get the sense that these guys are just incredibly hardened. They've got nothing except their coats. And here they are living off the moment that they're catching. I wonder whether it was much different a thousand years ago. I have not eaten the meat yet because it's got a reputation in Mongolia for carrying the Black Death. And sorry that if my words sound a bit slurred, but they've been giving me a lot of Mongol vodka made from yak yogurt. 
This is about as far as you can get, I think, from living in a city like back home in Australia. <laughs> Mongolians are warm and generous people, but on the outside they really reflect the landscape. The landscape isn't affectionate, it's not kind. And perhaps that's why people always believe that the Mongols were barbaric. Because they are the hardest people that I've ever met. But in confronting death, they have to be hardened. Because out here, if you don't accept that life is going to be hard, then you're not going to get through. The people out here never complain. They accept the way things are. And that's something I'd like to take with me from this journey. For the past eight days, Dashnyam's guided me through the high passes of the Altai. But now he's got to return to his family before the way back is blocked by snow. Chill. He has to go back the exact same route that we just came. He's going to do it in two days on the way back. I've no idea really how. I'm now more alone than ever. Winter's bearing down, and there's still 8,000 kilometers to go. Beyond those mountains lies the greatest challenge, Kazakhstan, the largest nomad nation on Earth, where the temperature ranges from 50 above to 50 below. In a country devastated by Soviet rule, I'm about to ride into a wasteland called the Starving Steppe and the coldest winter in 40 years. I'm going to have to draw on everything I've learnt to survive. <laughs> 